Nowadays, to live a Spartan life means living a strict and austere existence, without luxuries or comforts. But how much of this reflects the ancient culture of the Greek city-state of Sparta? Watch this video to find out if life in Sparta really was as arduous as commonly believed. Sometime after 1000 BCE, during the early Iron Age, four villages in the Laconia region of Greece came together to form the city-state of Sparta. The new city was located in the fertile Eurotas Valley, which gave these early Spartans an abundance of farmland and food. Some historians believe that the name Sparta stems from a verb meaning to sow, and that the city's name comes from the productiveness of the soil. In its early years, the people of Sparta were renowned for their artistry rather than their military. They created poetry and exported pottery and ivory carvings. Their military leanings started to form during the First Messenian War in 743 BCE. Once the Second Messenian War ended, the Messenians had become a slave population to Sparta. The Spartans called these slaves helots, and from then on, all adult Spartan males were forbidden from doing manual labor. This delegation of work gave the Spartans a standing army of men, who were not bound by farming seasons and could be available to fight at any time. Some believe that the defeat of the Messenians directly affected the Spartan culture, as they had to continuously subdue these contentious subjects. Historians don't know much about Sparta compared to their neighbors in Athens, because Spartans left few records. We can only speculate whether this is because they did not write down their own history, or whether their literature simply did not survive. Any descriptions of Spartan life were written by outsiders, like the Athenian historian Thucydides, who lived during the 5th century BCE. The daily life of the Spartans had become so mixed with myth and legend that we may never have a clear and accurate picture of what it was like, but we can see how it compares to its Greek contemporaries. Sparta stood apart from other Greek city-states in many ways. Firstly, they discouraged trade with outsiders. Instead, the Helots farmed and produced everything the Spartans needed to survive. As well as Spartans and Helots, Sparta had a third class of people, the Perioikoi. The Perioikoi were free non-citizens of Sparta, who were not slaves, but were not allowed to participate in Sparta's form of government. The Perioikoi made items such as shoes, clothes, tools, and pottery. They were also allowed to trade with other city-states if they needed goods that could not be found in Sparta. The Spartans felt that extended contact with other city-states would weaken their government and give rise to foreign ideas, so it seems that they used the Perioikoi as intermediaries. Another reason the trade was limited in Sparta was their form of money. Instead of coins, the Spartans used iron bars. Legend has it that an ancient Spartan leader thought that this form of currency would be too heavy to steal but it also restricted trade, as other city-states weren't too happy receiving iron as payment for goods. In place of trade, Sparta was an agricultural economy. When they needed more land to farm, they simply took it from someone else, probably contributing to their fearsome reputation. In governance, Sparta was also different from its counterparts. Sparta was considered an oligarchic society with two hereditary kings, one that would always be in place to rule the city and one that could travel with and rule the army. This system differed dramatically from the democracy that formed across the rest of ancient Greece. However, the kings did not have autonomous control, and the Spartans also had a government. The Spartans had a set of rules, similar to a constitution, that governed their way of life. It was called the Great Retro, or Great Saying, as it was not written but passed down through oral tradition. The Great Retro dictated the organization of the Spartan government and broke it down into four parts. The Diarchy, the Ephors Council, the Gerosia, and the Apella. The diarchy referred to the two royal rulers, but the Ephors Council consisted of five elected Spartan men. The Ephors Council was the most powerful part of the Spartan government, and they had the final word on laws, wars, and kingly conduct. The Gerosia was made up of 28 elderly Spartans, as well as the two kings. To become a member of the Gerosia, you had to be a Spartan male over the age of 60. Once citizens approved a candidate, they became a member of the Gerosia for life. The Gerosia prepared matters and issues that were then submitted to the Apella. The Apella was an assembly of male Spartan citizens over the age of 30. This assembly would vote on matters that the Gerosia and Ephors put forward. The Apella voted on proposed changes in law, foreign policy, and successions. They would also oversee appointing military commanders and electing the Gerosia and the Ephors. While the Spartan system of government was patriarchal and excluded women from partaking, 
Spartan women had a lot more freedom than the Athenians. Sparta was relatively progressive regarding women's rights, with both girls and boys starting education at around the age of six. Although they were educated separately, the teachings were primarily the same for both sexes and focused on military preparation and physical education. Spartan women could own land, wear short dresses, and marry later than their Athenian counterparts. They learned wrestling, discus, javelin, and how to manage horses. Despite women being banned from the Olympic Games, a wealthy Spartan woman named Siniska was able to secure an Olympic win by being the breeder and trainer of the winning horses in a chariot race. This respect for women was held in the utmost contempt by other Greeks. Aristotle thought that the laws regarding women being able to have their own wealth and property were what led to Sparta's downfall and disdainfully viewed Spartan women as living in every sort of intemperance and luxury. Spartans revered physical fitness above all else, so any baby judged by the ephors to be ill or have a disability could be killed. This law may seem shocking, but it was common practice across Greece that parents could abandon a newborn. A child was not welcomed into the family until they were five days old, before which they could be legally left to die or be found by strangers and raised as a slave. Spartan society was geared towards producing soldiers. At the age of seven, boys would enter the agogi, a military school where they were trained to read, write, and fight. They were subject to a harsh life, so they could easily adjust to a life of war. They were beaten to make them tough and given little to eat so they could be used to living on rations. The boys were encouraged to steal food if they wanted it, but were punished if they were caught, not because they stole, but because they were not stealthy enough to get away with it. Between the ages of 7 and 17, boys and girls learned dancing, singing, and writing alongside their physical education. From 18 to 19, boys then learned survival techniques, and at 20, they were enlisted in the army. These young men would live in army barracks with their fellow soldiers and were part of the standing army until the age of 30. They would then become full citizens and lived in their own homes with their wives and children. Spartan men could marry from the age of 20, but any amorous 20-somethings would have to sneak out of the barracks to meet up with a lover. Luckily for them, their training must have helped them in this matter. While most marriages in Greece were arranged, the Spartans could marry for love, choosing or rejecting a partner as they wished. In Sparta, a wedding, even an arranged one, could not go ahead without the woman's agreement. If you were a free non-Spartan, a member of the Perioika, you still had to provide military service, but you could not become a full citizen and be a part of the Spartan government. The life of the Perioikoi is not well documented. The literal translation means those who dwell around, and it is thought that they acted as trade liaisons and craftspeople for the Spartans. The worst class in ancient Sparta was the helots. While personal slaves were common in Greece, the slaves of Sparta were owned by the community rather than individuals. They were subject to brutal treatment, and the ephors would annually declare war on the helots to try and prevent revolts. A Spartan could kill a helot for any reason, including being too healthy or too handsome. Spartan society relied on the constant work of the helots for all their agricultural needs and could not afford this class of people to rise up against them. Despite their rough existence, helots had more freedoms than other Greek slaves. They could own their own property, although their homes would probably not have been as nice as citizens' homes. Spartan houses were much the same as other Greek homes at the time. They were made of bricks of mud that had been left in the sun to harden and had roof tiles made of red clay. They would typically be one story and contain a courtyard. No archaeological remains have been found of the barracks where Spartan men spent their 20s, but they were thought to be constructed in much the same way as the houses. They would probably be square or U-shaped with a central courtyard flanked with a roofed walkway. Despite their reputation as Philistines, one of Sparta's few remaining architectural sites is an ancient theater. At the time of its construction, it would have been the largest in Greece, with a seating capacity of 15,000. The backdrop of this theater was a magnificent view of Mount Tagetus and would have been an impressive performative space. While little of it has survived, Sparta's poetry, music, and dance were renowned throughout the ancient world. Historians know that people would travel for miles to witness the festival performances of Spartan choirs and dancers, and the army itself was known to sing when advancing into battle. Life in Sparta was regimented and dominated by your status. The daily life of a Spartan man or woman would have revolved around sport and exercise. They had a reputation for fighting, but were taught to do so without anger. Even Spartan weddings contained a playful fight between the bride and groom. 
Alongside their military education, they sang and danced. It is said that girls would sing songs about the boys during public performances, teasing ones who were not doing well in their training. When considering how the Spartans lived, it is next to impossible to separate fact from fiction, real life from legend. Certainly, the Spartans did appreciate strength and endurance, but they also enjoyed dance, music, poetry, and art. While their upbringing was brutal, they were spared any form of physical labor and didn't have to farm their own land. They were undoubtedly a nation of strong fighters, but perhaps our modern-day understanding of a Spartan existence does a disservice to the lives of the real Spartans. To learn more about the Spartans, check out our book, Spartans, a captivating guide to the fierce warriors of ancient Greece, including Spartan military tactics, the Battle of Thermopylae, how Sparta was ruled, and more. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. Also, grab your free Mythology Bundle ebook while it's still available. All links are in the description. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.